Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the best Chinese EV maker of them all? That's EV for electric vehicle, yo. And by best, we're talking about the best out of a whopping 487 Chinese electric car makers, as reported by the Wall Street Journal a couple months back. And I'm not sure that today we will get to the answer of who's the best because most of these companies are simply too new to really tell. The one we are focusing on today. Neo, which went public last week on September 12th at a market cap of about 6.4 billion U.S. dollars, had only delivered 481 of its ES8 seven-seater SUVs by July 31st, as detailed in its IPO prospectus. And it's only scheduled to deliver a total of 10,000 by the end of the year, which was why I was excited to see one actually on the road last week when I was in Chengdu, China. It didn't look bad, but it wasn't striking. Who am I to judge, though? I hate driving, and I don't even own a car. Although I do borrow a Tesla three from time to time. And Ray, you've both seen and driven my car, and you know that I'm not super particular about it. So there you go. We aren't gearheads, and we really would need a magic mirror to tell us which car is the best. But what we can tell you, which I do think we're good at, is how Neo got started and how it's different from its competition. Especially this company I know quite well, Xpeng Motors or Xiaopeng Tichu. Yep. Neo versus Xiaopeng. It's another one of those. You guessed it. Tencent versus Alibaba wars, with Neo being backed by Tencent and Xiaopeng being backed by Alibaba. Again, we have the two ma two horse race, as always. But we'll be concentrating on Neo today. Although there's no avoiding talking a little bit about Xiaopeng. They're as different as night and day. What are we waiting for? Start your engines, guys. The president's key economic team goes to China.、Uh, after whole night thinking, I say I still want to do it. Hi everyone, we are Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily, powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. We are a new weekly podcast focused on giving you a peek into what's buzzing within the tech community in China. We uncover and contextualize unique insights, perspectives, and takeaways on headline tech news that don't always make it into English language coverage, so you can be smarter about the world of China tech. Tech Buzz China is a part of Pandaily dot com, a new English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. I am one of your two co-hosts, Yingying Lu. And I'm your other co-host, Rayma. Shout out to some of our select listeners: David Denstead, Christopher Lin, Su Kang Li, Jackie Liang, Johan Biermann, and to all those who continue to give constructive feedback. Oh, and a very special thank you to our new partners at Deal Street Asia, who began syndicating our podcast this week. Hello, if you're listening to us from DSA. If you enjoy listening to us, please take the time to leave us a rating, a review on iTunes, Facebook, or wherever you get your podcast. If we want to talk about Neo, originally known as Next EV, we got to talk about Li Bin, aka William Li, who is Neo's Lin Hun Ren Wu, or Neo's heart and soul, and also its celebrity founder, chairman, and chief executive officer. Li Bing. Now that name sounds familiar. Here's a test for our most hardcore fans. Where have we mentioned it before? Well, besides the fact that it is a pretty common name, some of you might remember we mentioned a key character named Li Bing from the episode on Mobike. He was the angel investor who, legend has it, supposedly had the idea for an on-demand bike rental system and wrote the initial check for Huawei Wei to execute the project. If you remember that from our earlier episode, you are definitely a tech buzzer extraordinaire, and should tweet at us for swag. Seriously, but back to Li Bing. By the time Mobike was getting started in 2014-15, he was already quite famous, right? 
Yep, even though he is only 43 years old this year, he had his first IPO eight years ago on November 17, 2010, for a company called Bit Auto or Yi Che Ji Tuan. He was also founder and CEO and chairman there until January of this year, that is, when he abdicated the CEO role. However, he remains chairman. Bit Auto, which trades on the NYSE under BITA, is about $1.6 billion in market cap these days. On its own website, it describes itself as a leading provider of internet content and marketing services and transaction services for China's fast-growing automotive industry. I think, though, TechCrunch explains it a little bit better by writing that it's, quote, cars.com, consumer reports, and auto trader all rolled into one, unquote. All you really need to take away is that it's one of the leading car-related internet companies in China. Now, you might be wondering, that's cool that Li Bin founded China's cars.com, but does that make him qualified to make an electric car, which is probably quite different from uh, selling cars? Well, what if I told you he's a really great investor in the transportation sector, or mobility sector, as it's fashionable to call it these days? I'm not going to go into all of his successful investments here, but according to a detailed profile on him last year, he's invested into at least 32 companies in this sector, including five unicorns. That's including Mobike, by the way. In Mobike, he began with a 29% stake and fully exited the company earlier this year when it was bought by May Twin for almost $3 billion. Not bad, right? That's why Chinese people call him Chu Xing Jiao Fu. Chu Xing, which means travel, and Jiao Fu, which means godfather, which is basically saying he is the boss in this space. Everyone is a godfather in China. It's like the most common complimentary title. I think it sounds a little ridiculous. Although, please do feel free to call us China Tech Podcast Godmother. <laughs> but again, Ray, being a good angel investor in the car space doesn't mean you're good at making cars. What else you got? Okay, okay, you got me. I don't know. Li Bing was a sociology major at Peking University and was never known for his technical chops. I guess the argument most of his fans throw out is that, so what? Elon Musk didn't know how to make cars either before he took over Tesla. What Li Bing really does have, though, is a reputation for making money, which helps him to raise money, which is, if you think about it, a key competitive advantage to making cars. Because it takes a lot and a lot of money. Cold, hard cash. I am just giving you a hard time, Ray. Your reasons are all valid. First of all, Richard Liu of JD and Li Guoqing of Dangdang were all sociology majors. Remember, you don't really get to pick your major in China, so it doesn't have much correlation with your actual interests, just your Gaokao entrance exam score. Secondly, Li Bin has a pretty great reputation in the tech sector in China already. Liu Arhai, formerly of Legend Capital and now with his own fund, Joy Capital, a very respected VC and a Midas lister, summed it up quite nicely. Everyone believes in Li Bin because everyone has made money off of betting on him succeeding. Even when Mr. Liu hesitated on the Mobike deal, he went ahead and invested just because it was a Li Bin deal. And I mean, look what happened with that. I believe he's done just fine. Well, I would say Li Bin had a pretty awesome reputation in China. It's now a little bit more mixed, although I really don't think it's his fault. The main issue was this person named Jia Yueting, YT Jia, founder of La Echo and Faraday Future, the latter an electric car company that, well, basically turned out to be a fraud. Actually, technically we don't really know what happened, whether it was really all fraud or just crazy bad strategy, but there are plenty of lawsuits outstanding and plenty of people, myself included, believe that it was the former. But Jia Yueting basically tried to beat Netflix, Apple, and Tesla all at the same time, zero kidding here, and failed miserably. But what he did was that he left a stink on the EV industry in particular, because he was so high profile about his product announcements, the Faraday Future FF91, which turned out to be complete vaporware, that Chinese people just began associating all sorts of negative things with any fancy electric car concepts they saw. This meant that when Neo first showed off its car last April and started taking pre-orders last December, people understandably asked, 
Is Li Bing just another Jia Yueting, or is he a Lei Jun, the Xiaomi founder who actually delivers the hardware he promises? The fear runs deep. One article cheekily called Neo and its fellow EVs the cars that came out of PowerPoints. I mean, that's kind of true. Milk Tea's sister, wife of JD CEO Richard Liu, wrote that Richard invested in Neo after a brief 15-minute presentation by Li Bing. And he wasn't the only billionaire who invested. Remember, we said that Li Bing knows that cars are very, very expensive to make. So he got not one, but six billionaires to invest early in Neo, knowing that it would take a lot of capital before there would be any Neo cars actually on the road. Tony Ma of Tencent, Lei Jun of Xiaomi, Neil Shen of Sequoia Capital, Lei Zhang of Hill House Capital, Li Xiang of Auto Home. Funny aside, there, aside from traditional car makers, the person Li Bin was most afraid of getting into the AV space as well was Lei Jun, which is why he was super relieved when Lei Jun didn't do that and instead became an investor. Well, that worked because Neo raised about 2.5 billion dollars in four rounds over four years. Before going public, but it's still losing money rapidly. It had half a billion dollar net loss for the first half of this year, on a whopping seven million dollars of revenue from vehicle sales. That's right, the entirety of its revenue so far in the company's entire existence is literally the same as the median price of a house in Atherton here in Silicon Valley. That's a popular enclave, by the way, of many Chinese VCs and tech entrepreneurs. While the company still has six hundred sixty-eight million dollars on its balance sheet as of June thirtieth, most people think it was going to have to raise more capital quickly to really ramp up production. It decided to go IPO rather than do another private round. Why? We really don't know. The rumor is that Tencent, which owns about thirteen percent of the shares and twenty-two percent of the vote, was unwilling to put in more money. It does own five percent of Tesla, after all. So maybe Tencent was freaked out by the lack of profits and the immense need for capital they're seeing there. Either way, IPO plans were pretty concrete by April of this year, and SoftBank was rumored to participate. But funding was not secured. SoftBank pulled out last month, although it was only supposed to be putting in two hundred million dollars. That made the IPO look even less attractive. You see. Neo was initially rumored to go public at thirty-seven billion dollars USD. Yeah, I honestly have no idea why, but that was a rumor on Chinese media back in December of two thousand seventeen. There was a lot of exuberance back then, though, if you'll remember, around all Chinese pre-IPO tech companies. Anyway, when Neo's SEC filings came through, the number that Neo was supposed to raise was more like one point eight billion. When it finally did come to pass, however, after SoftBank said no, the actual fundraise was closer to one billion dollars, basically at the lowest end of expectations. For what we said earlier, is a market cap of six point four billion dollars, thirty-seven billion dollar USD market cap. No, more like thirty-seven billion RMB. And since Neo's comp was Tesla, and everyone called it China's Tesla, it didn't help that Elon Musk was going a bit nuts on Twitter and on YouTube. Supposedly, Li Bin was even asked during the IPO roadshow, "Do you smoke, drink, or tweet?" Hilarious stuff. But it's a lot deeper than that. Detail-oriented fans probably noticed that we put quotation marks around the words "China's Tesla" in the title for this episode. That's because it really isn't much of a Tesla. There are so many things that are different. But first, Li Bing has publicly stated that he doesn't want to be China's Tesla. He wants to be the world's Neo. Tesla's still a great company to be compared to. I mean, it's still got a market cap that dwarfs some traditional car makers. But he's been smart not to overemphasize this point in English. I mean, Libyan has dismissed Tesla as being an old company born out of the internet age, as opposed to Neo, which is only four years old and has mobile internet roots. Again, our U.S. listeners might not feel like this is a super big distinction, but in China, where the smartphone really is the totality of many users' internet experiences, it's a well-acknowledged generational divide. How does this apply to cars, though? Well, the first thing is that apparently Neo believes this means they don't need to make cars. They don't need to make cars. Exactly right. 
Neo does not make its own cars. See what I mean? But it's really not a Tesla. Neo outsources all manufacturing to Jianghuai Qichu, a publicly listed state-owned auto manufacturer in China. Well, technically, it's a contract for five years, and Neo is supposed to be building its own facilities. Anyway, Jianghuai is known for making cheap economy-class cars, so you can imagine the difficulty of it. All of a sudden, now making the most expensive domestic SUV in mainland China, the ES8 is also supposed to have one of the highest aluminum contents in SUVs, second only to a Jaguar. I don't exactly know what that means, only that it's very difficult to do so. Perhaps that's why, up until the IPO, Neo has only delivered 1,381 cars, or only 900 or so since June 30th, at a rate of what it's looking like approximately 100 per week. But whatever, right? If you drink the Kool-Aid, who cares about the fact that Neo doesn't make its own stuff? Maybe if you're tired of seeing Elon tweet that he just got back from the factory at 3 a.m. in the morning, this would be a plus, not a minus. It also looks like Neo doesn't make its own batteries. I mean, that makes sense. If you're not making your own cars, why would you be making your own batteries? Its prospectus says that it's only qualified one manufacturer for its batteries, which is maybe concerning. But like you said, Ray, if you drink the Kool-Aid, who cares about who makes the batteries when there's so many cool ways of charging your car that Neo offers that no one else does? First, there is the power home. Okay, that's charging at home, and that's not that innovative. And of course, you can use the 214,000 charging piles available nationwide in China. But oh look, Neo is going to have charging trucks called Power Mobile. You can charge for about 60 miles in 10 minutes. And how about so-called Power Swap, which are stations where you can swap your battery quickly for a fully charged one. See, this is mobile internet thinking at play here. But what Neo does have in common with Tesla is the price point. At half a million RMB or so, we're talking about a seventy thousand dollar SUV, and with government subsidies of up to ten thousand dollars, maybe your net price is sixty thousand. Sure, it's cheaper than a Tesla X, and actually cheaper than any other luxury car in China, which comes with significant tariffs. But again, this comparison only makes sense if you really do treat Neo as a luxury brand. Is Neo a luxury brand? Well, Li Bin certainly is trying to make it into one. He said over and over again that Neo is a lifestyle, not a car. According to Liu Erhai, Neo is selling you a service, not a car. He thinks that's why Tesla won't win in China because, according to him, EVs are still rather difficult to maintain in China due to poor infrastructure, and so Chinese customers will need a whole chain of services that are localized for their needs. Can a foreign company really do that? He thinks not. I never drove a car in China, so I'm not really sure what he's talking about. But I can understand what Neo thinks is a quote-unquote localized service model. For example, I saw one of their flagship Neo houses in Shanghai just last week. I didn't get to spend too much time there, but it's a very, very fancy-looking showroom. According to the prospectus, it's not just meant to be a sales center, but also where Neo owners and prospective users get together and chill, like a clubhouse of sorts. I'm quoting from the prospectus here. Neo houses may feature a lounge for our users to relax and socialize. Forums, which consists of a theater and which we intend to be a place for gatherings, meetings, or presentations, labs, which are bookable meeting rooms and workspaces, a library, an open kitchen, and a kids' joy camp. <laughs> This is just so bizarre. I mean, in the U.S., car dealerships are literally the places you want to leave as soon as possible. No offense to any of our fans who work there, but it's China. And as you said, neo houses are in prominent spaces in fancy shopping malls, not just some parking lot in the middle of nowhere. So it's possible, but I still find it a bit bizarre. Although this is not the first time I've heard of Chinese entrepreneurs applying the concept of user experience to an extreme. Didn't Li Bin also announce that he will hold one third of his shares in a separate trust and give Neo owners a chance to give feedback on what to do with the profits on those shares? 
Yeah, he also said he wants to reach a hundred percent user satisfaction as his KPI. But I am so confused. As a driver, my satisfaction comes from driving a vehicle that I know will keep me safe and is easy to maintain. I don't need to meet the other half a million Neo app users or hang out with them at the seven Neo houses. Well, guess who agrees with you? Xpeng Motors, or Xiaopeng Xichu, the other high-flying EV unicorn in China right now with an internet DNA. It's already raised two billion dollars and also has a celebrity entrepreneur, He Xiaopeng, who co-founded UC Web, a leading web browser that was eventually acquired by Alibaba in the largest internet M&A deal at that time. As we mentioned in this episode's introduction, Alibaba is also a big investor in Xpeng, and while they already raised four billion RMB so far this year, supposedly they're looking to raise another six billion RMB, or basically a billion US dollars, by the end of this year. While like Neo, Xiaopeng doesn't make its own cars, it also outsources to an auto manufacturer. It does have a drastically different price point at just 35k USD or so, half the price of a Neo. However, instead of building fancy customer experience centers, Xiaopeng has been focused on building infrastructure, putting in chargers all over the country. It also hasn't delivered cars in volume yet, but claims that's because it's being extra careful. Everyone else is delivering their version 1.0 models, but we are taking our time because we want to deliver a version 2.0 car. That's what He Xiaopeng is fond of saying, anyways. It's kind of true. They basically gave their employees the first 400 cars to test. The feedback of those employees led to changes, which will be reflected in the cars being delivered later this year. Xiaopeng is widely regarded as one of the main non-traditional contenders for EV glory. Although, as we've said earlier, there are almost 500 such companies now in China, and three others—WM, Weima, Baiten, and Youxia—are in unicorn category. Many, it must be said, are going after the same price point as Xiaopeng. Without doing a thorough analysis here and just looking at the top-funded players, less seem to be going after Neo's price band. With the exception of Faraday Future, that is, whose newly revived car-making efforts suggest a 350k price tag per vehicle, although there's no delivery date in sight, so that number may just as well be meaningless. In fact, since now Li Bing has indeed delivered cars and proven himself able to make cars from PowerPoint, his main critics ask, "How fast can he deliver them? And do people really want sixty thousand dollar cars?" I don't. But anyway, both of these questions came to a head in early August with He Xiaopeng saying to media that no car company can deliver ten thousand cars this year, in direct opposition to what Li Bin had promised customers and shareholders. To prove himself, Li Bin immediately proposed a bet: if he does not deliver ten thousand Neos by the end of 2018, he would personally gift He Xiaopeng an ES8. What follows, though, is really much more interesting. So He Xiaopeng posts this on his WeChat moment and says that he gladly accepts the bet and thanks Li Bing for his gift in advance. Then Li Xueling, founder of YY, replies to that post and says, "No way this will happen." He provides the following two reasons, both oddly written in English but perfectly intelligible. So I will read them to you here. Number one. In China, whoever turns the basic user of electric cars into the same user base as Pinduoduo wins. Two, do not face urban white-collar workers to build cars, to build those for rural use cars. He who wins a diaosi wins the world. That's pretty funny. I'll translate real fast for listeners unfamiliar with the terms Li Xueling is using. But basically, he's saying that Li Bin's mission is doomed because in China, you should really be appealing to the lower classes, not the well-to-do. There are so many more of them, after all. Not surprising coming from the founder of YY, though. Remember, YY is a company that features prominently in our episode on live streaming a few weeks back. We also cover the diaosi, aka loser economy, in that episode, and delve deep into the pindodo phenomenon too in episode seventeen. Hint: Li Xueling got rich off of diaosi, so of course he's going to have a soft spot for them. Yeah, it seems like we're back to the same topic, which has been buzzing in Chinese media for most of this year. What is the winning strategy for China? 
Is it consumption upgrade, i.e. appealing to upscale customers? Or is it consumption trickle down, i.e. appealing to 屌丝 I'm going to cheat and say that I think both strategies work. In the U.S. as well, you see a sort of barbell development. For example, in retail, the luxury brands and the dollar brands are winning. Everyone else is getting creamed. But I'm not confident applying this thinking to electric cars. And maybe we don't need to, because it seems that for EVs, the macro trends are just too good in the near term. Maybe your strategy doesn't matter that much because your timing is just so good. Yeah, in China, EVs are the thing. The Chinese government is pushing for EVs in a big way, ostensibly due to air pollution, but also to be able to show that it's a global tech leader. The Wall Street Journal says that there have been 15 billion dollars in subsidies already, with another 47 billion dollars in the pipeline. China already has over 50 percent market share in EVs. Which exceeded one million vehicles globally in 2017, and they want to have seven million more on the road by 2025. Neo is certainly well aware of Chinese government policy. That's probably why its Chinese name is Weilai, which means blue sky coming. It's also a homonym for future. But can it come out on top? Subsidies are scheduled to phase out in two years, and as we said, there are a handful of other well-funded competitors. And don't forget older, non-internet but perfectly capable car makers like the Warren Buffett-invested BYD, which already sells more cars than Tesla. And while Tesla really should have been in China much earlier, it's also in Shanghai now. So yeah, there's that. Yeah, there's some great tailwinds, but you also pointed out the headwinds. So in the face of such Darwinian competition, Neo really rushed to go IPO, despite having a pretty weak story. But don't take our word for it. We asked our friend Elliot what he thought. But first, please introduce yourself. My name is Elliot Zagman, and I am a writer covering Chinese tech. For the outlets Technode in English, and I also write for the website Hu Xiaowang in Chinese. In addition to that, I am an organization development consultant for Chinese tech firms, as well as an executive coach for Chinese tech founders and CEOs. Honestly, Elliot writes some super detailed stuff. You might want to check out his latest piece on debt, which features some of our analyses on zero room and Chinese rental real estate. But back to Neo. Is this a good time for Neo to be going public? Is this a good time for Neo to be going public? Absolutely not. It's a terrible time for them to be going public. Sales for vehicles in China has absolutely plummeted over the last year or two. And then, in addition to that, I think we're now seeing just how difficult it can be to mass produce. Electric vehicles. We're seeing this with Tesla, and then we're also seeing this with companies like Faraday Future. But it is really, really costly, and you need a very, very long runway. So they need this money, but credit is drying up in China. It's very, very hard to get private financing right now in China, especially for something like this. They're not going to be able to pay back their investors、uh, in the near term. So I think that's why they're going public: is that they need cash, even if it is. The wrong time for them to be doing it. We really couldn't find too much support online that Neo was ripe for a blockbuster IPO, which kind of explains why, as we've already described, it priced at the low end of its offering and traded flat the first day. But then, after we asked Elliot this question, Neo shot up like a rocket on its second day of trading, going up seventy-five percent. Maybe just to prove us wrong. Anyway, if you're a Neo believer and Libyan fan, though, we are happy for you. I mean, even if the IPO timing is awkward, come on, seven million dollars of revenues, I could still understand why Libyan wanted to go for it. First, it's likely that he really is running out of money. Making cars is super expensive, and Neo has three billion RMB of debt due mid next year, apparently. And I couldn't follow all the math exactly, but it was reported that he might be losing thirty thousand dollars per vehicle right now, just in costs. Of course, with economies of scale, that should go down. But more worryingly, while he does have sixteen thousand pre-orders, only six thousand of those customers paid a deposit of six thousand, with most of the customers paying a nominal seven hundred yi xiang jin. Or intention fee, which makes the demand for Neos a lot more questionable. Yeah, new orders in July was 
1,900, and in August was just 1,600. The same automotive reporter noted that given that the factory in Hefei can already churn out 900 vehicles per month, are we sure Neo's problem is one of production? Or is it really one of insufficient demand? So maybe a secondary reason, although probably a very distant secondary reason, is the fact that going public may help sales too. This is just pure conjecture on my part, but an IPO, especially in the U.S., is a supreme stamp of confidence and credibility in China, especially for consumer brands. Remember what Pinduoduo CEO Colin Huang said? He claimed that Pinduoduo didn't need to go public, but that it wanted to do so in order to gain more trust from its customers. Right. In China, it's super difficult to get listed since it's a very onerous application process. The wait time is a few years. And then you have a minimum one-year, maybe multi-year lockup. Oh, and you have to be profitable for most of the boards. So the NYSE, or NASDAQ, seems super easy by comparison. But many Chinese people don't get that. They don't differentiate. And they think that the U.S. government has done an incredible amount of due diligence on the companies listed here and that they've put their stamp of approval on it. It's a common misconception, and I encounter it all the time. And it could work a wee bit in Neo's favor. They're a listed company now, after all. Consumers might think they're more trustworthy. All right, what do you think, guys? Is Neo going to win over China and later the globe with its amazing customer experience? Or is competitor Xiaopeng better suited? Because after all, he who wins a diaosi wins the world. Tweet at Tech Buzz China and let us know your thoughts. We'd like to give a shout out to our partners, SubChina. In addition to our podcast here with Pan Daily, they publish the Excellent Seneca Podcast, a weekly discussion of current affairs on China with journalists, writers, academics, policymakers, and business people. So while we only focus on tech. They really give you the entire overview. Okay, that's all for this week, folks. Thank you for listening. We really enjoyed putting this together, as always, and we're open to any comments or suggestions. You can find us on Twitter at the Pan Daily at Tech Buzz China, and my personal Twitter account is spelled G I N Y G I N Y. And my Twitter is spelled R U I M A. We'll be back here same time next week. Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily is powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. PanDaily dot com is a new English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Our producers are Carol Yin and Kaiser Guo. Our intern is Wang Mengli. Hold up. 